Greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture by Mark Oppenheimer, sponsored by the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm Marie Griffith, Center Director, and it's great to see all of you here in this room. And once more, also to welcome those of you joining us by Zoom from home. This is our final public event of this academic year, and you know it's been so good to be back in person with those of you who could be here while still allowing for an online option. And I imagine we'll continue uh, in this mode in future. We're working on our fall programming now, so if you're on our email list, you'll get word of that this summer. And if you're not on our email list but would like to be added to it, please sign up at the welcome table outside this room or shoot us an email at rap, R-A-P, at wustel.edu. After tonight's lecture, there will be a reception and book signing with our speaker uh, right outside these doors, so we hope you can stay for that as well. And now it's my pleasure to invite my colleague, Professor Fanny Bialik, to the podium to introduce our distinguished speaker. Fanny is Assistant Professor of Religion and Politics in the John C. Danforth Center. Her research and teaching focus on contemporary religious ethics and political theory with an emphasis on feminist thought, Christian theology, and modern forms of power critique. She is co-editor of the collaborative networking site, Feminist Religion. She earned the PhD in religious studies from Brown University and her bachelor's degree in religious studies from Princeton University. And she is working on a book marvelously titled, Love in Time. Fanny. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's my great honor and pleasure to introduce Mark Oppenheimer as our speaker this evening. Oppenheimer is an award-winning author and journalist writing about religion in America, American politics and culture, American Judaism, fatherhood, and many other topics. He's the director of the Yale Journalism Initiative and a professor of English, divinity, and political science at Yale, where he also earned his bachelor's and doctorate, and is the author of many books, seven, um, including 13 in a Day, these are a few of my favorites, on bar and bar mitzvahs, Knocking on Heaven's Door on Religion and 60s Counterculture, and Weisenheimer on his experiences as a high school debater and argumentative adolescent. He's also a prolific magazine and newspaper writer, but with bylines in Slate, GQ, Christian Century, Tablet Magazine, where he also serves on the editorial board, and the New York Times, where I was first introduced to him, as he wrote a regular column on religion, beliefs, from 2010 to 2016. He might be best known to some in the audience tonight as one of the co-hosts of the popular Unorthodox podcast from Tablet Magazine, <laughs> the most streamed English language podcast on Judaism, released weekly since 2015. He joins us tonight to discuss his most recent project, Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Synagogue Shooting and the Soul of a Neighborhood, published this past October um, by Penguin Random House. In the book, he, approached the horror, he approaches the horror of the 2018 shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue as both a leading critic and interpreter of American Jewish life and the son of a longtime Squirrel Hill resident with deep family roots in the neighborhood. The book combines Oppenheimer's characteristically incisive writing on American politics and Jewish life with a kind of tenderness for the neighborhood, even a lightness. The reader has a sense that he treads carefully, not only because of the horror of the events, but as one treads carefully in one's grandparents' home, marveling at treasures fascinated by the, peculiarly, the peculiar familiarity of the unfamiliar that we can find even in family homes we've never entered before. He is in this book literally in his grandparents' home, or hometown at least, and unabashedly, and, um, but I think that this remarkable style characterizes his work more broadly. His writing is critical and unabashedly so, but full of tenderness, good humor, and kindness, which emanates from the page not as sarcasm or snark, but as joy, love, and even hope. It is as if he writes to say, as might be said of a home or a place of worship, welcome, welcome. Time spent here on these pages will be well spent because it's spent with others, 
thinking, arguing, laughing, and also in tears. I'm grateful to welcome Mark Oppenheimer here tonight for a time that I'm sure will be a gift to spend together. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professors Griffith and Bialik. This is really, really great to be here. Um, it's my second time ever in St. Louis and my first time ever at Washington University. And um, you know, I've emailed so many times over the years with the really, really august faculty here. I've had questions, and I've often sought them out for quotations, and I've um, you know, wanted to be in communication. And I've always had one question in mind when I've sent these emails, which is, do they say Wustle? <laughs> and it turns out you say Wustle. And I'm just so happy. That cheers me so much. Because when I send the emails, it's always like M. Griffith at Wustle.edu. And I think, I hope they say Wustle, because it feels so good on the tongue. And it turns out you say Wustle. OK, so now I feel like I'm, I'm mishpucha, like I'm family, because I've been saying it right all these years. I want to, um, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm grateful to those of you who have, uh, who have come out in person, and also uh, the uh, many of you who, who I understand are online um, with us tonight. Um, it's, a, it's been an interesting season in which to publish a book. And I've been really, really gratified that uh, wherever I've gone, and I'm guessing this is about my 40th city, and actually last for a long time. I think my next speaking engagement is in the fall. Um, people have turned out, and they've always, whether it was a crowd of five or a couple hundred, always brought incisive questions and, um, and passionate and compassionate comments. And I think already I can tell that, that tonight is no different. Um, here's what I want to do. I want to talk to you for, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the morning of October 27th, 2018. Then I want to read just a few pages uh, from the book. I actually always fall asleep when other people read pages from their books. So I keep it to really about two or three pages. And then I want to show you some photographs, uh, all of them from the book. And then we'll circle back, and I'll take some questions. Um, so, uh, And then afterwards, I'm, I'm so pleased. Nothing makes me happier than a reception afterwards. <laughs> right? That's, that's really, that's kind, of, that's kind of everything to me. So October 27th, 2018, I was in Newton, Massachusetts, about an hour and a half north of my hometown, two hours north of my hometown of New Haven, Connecticut. I was with my eldest daughter, Rebecca, and we were at the bat mitzvah of a summer camp friend of hers. This was, this was the year when she and all of her summer camp friends turned 12. <laughs> and because she goes to Camp Ramah in Palmer, Massachusetts, which weirdly is the district that draws from New England and then Washington, DC, skipping over New York and Pennsylvania. <laughs> We had a lot of invitations to Boston and then also suburban Maryland. And what I said to her was, I can't really promise that I'm going to get you to suburban Maryland uh, seven hours away very much. But when there's one that's really important to you in Boston, we'll, we'll get up early and make a road trip out of it. So we got to um, Temple Emmanuel in Newton probably at 9.30 or 10 in the morning. And we were inside at this bat mitzvah of her friend for, you know, a couple hours, three hours. And then we stayed for the lunch and afterwards. And of course, we didn't bring... Uh, our, our, our phones inside. We try to respect the Sabbath, at least, at least while we're in services on Saturday. And so it, looking back, it's kind of as astonishing to me because there were hundreds of people there. It was, this is one of those synagogues where there are two or bar bat mitzvahs every weekend. I mean, this is a real uh, lot of Jews. And um, there were hundreds of people inside because my daughter's friend had hurt a couple hundred people. And then the other boy, who I don't think she'd ever met before, but was sharing the bima with her that day, he had a couple hundred people. And it was, it was a, a huge crowd. Surely, there were people who knew what was going on in Pittsburgh, right? People had their phones out. And surely, somebody was whispering about the fact that there was a mass slaughter of Jews going on in Pittsburgh. But it's a testament, I think, both to those people's discretion and I would also say to that extraordinary teaching in Judaism that you don't let the sad crush the, the joyful, right? This is from Talmud, that when, when a funeral march and a wedding march reach the intersection at the same time, you know this teaching, that the funeral march has to give way and let the wedding procession go forward, right? That we always, we always prefer the joyful. Um, so people kept their mouths shut, and nobody allowed it to ruin that morning for the bat mitzvah girl. So it wasn't until about 1 PM in the afternoon when we got back outside to our car, and I did take out my phone, and I said, let me just see if there's any texts from mom or anything, that I saw all of these texts saying, did you hear about Pittsburgh? Do you know about Pittsburgh? Are you going to Pittsburgh? And I thought, why are all these people texting me about Pittsburgh? And my daughter, 
must have noticed that something was up because she said, Dad, what, what's wrong? So I, I opened up one of the news apps on my phone, and I must have just gotten this stricken look on my face because then she got very panicked. She said, Dad, what is going on? And as I was reading the headlines, I explained to her as best I could. I said, Rebecca, there, there's been a shooting of Jews in synagogue in Squirrel Hill. And she said, Squirrel Hill? She said, Dad, isn't that where we're from? And I don't know how she knew that, because if she's not from Squirrel Hill. She's from New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts. But I guess she'd paid enough attention at family Passovers and Thanksgivings and whatever to know that Grandpa, my dad, was from Squirrel Hill, and that, in fact, his father and his father were from Squirrel Hill, and two generations before that were also from Pittsburgh. So she got it. She somehow inferred that this was, this was family that, that had connections to this attack. And I said to her, I said, yeah, Squirrel Hill is where we're from. That's exactly right. And it's funny. I don't usually talk about this, but I'll, it's, it's, I think you'll appreciate this. What we did at that point, because there was a party that evening, so, but there were four or five hours to kill between getting out of the lunch about 1 PM and the party that was going to start at 6. And I had said, I'll stay in town for the whole thing, and I'll make myself busy until late at night, and then I'll drive you home. So we didn't know what to do for four or five hours. And I said, why don't, we, why don't we go to Harvard? We were 20 minutes from Harvard. I said, let's go to Harvard Hillel, just so we can be around some other Jews. And she said, OK. And I'll just, I, again, I don't usually tell this story, but it's on my mind right now. We got to Harvard Hillel, and we walked in. And there was, again, it was about 1 o'clock. And the only students who were left were some clearly orthodox students who had been having lunch. And they were laughing and having a good time. And I realized they don't have their phones on. They don't know what's happened. And then I went to the bathroom, and Rebecca went and found a ladies' room. And then when we sort of got out and kind of you know, flowed back into the main lounge area, the students had all gone silent. And I realized, oh, they just found out what happened. Those next few days were, were, were painful and difficult, I think, not just for Pittsburgh Jews and not just for Jews, but I think for human beings who were paying attention. And for me, it was a very intense and interesting time, because one of the questions that always occurs to me whenever anything painful happens in the world of American religion is, am I going to write about it? And there is a kind of macabre, weird way in which um, scholars, but, in, but I think especially journalists who often are writing about contemporary events, have to decide when and if they're going to strike out to the place, the scene of the, of the happening, and, and get paid to write about it? When do you turn, turn this horrible, awful thing that's happened into a professional opportunity? And initially, I thought, I don't want to in this case. Um, for one thing, I had no interest in the killer, uh, the alleged killer, Robert Bowers. Um, there have been good books about the minds of people who commit these mass murders. One of, my, one of the books I admire most is Columbine by the journalist David Cullen about the Columbine killing. That is a book that's principally about the two perpetrators of the killing. Um, but I wasn't interested in writing that kind of book. The idea of spending time in the deep, swampy recesses of the anti-Semitic, racist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant, far-right, white nationalist internet did not strike me as an appealing way to spend a year or two of my life. So I didn't want to get inside the mind of Robert Bowers. Nor, interestingly, did I want to write about the 11 victims of this killing in Squirrel Hill, which it turns out is the, the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history. It's not that these 11 people aren't important. All souls are important. And these 11 surely each deserve a book. But it wasn't the book I wanted to write. No, increasingly, what I realized I felt called to write was a book about the neighborhood of Squirrel Hill, that thing that Rebecca, my daughter, identified, which was that this was our neighborhood ancestrally, began to feel very, very real and very personal over the next week or so. Because I knew both from family lore, but also from my own research as a graduate student and, and sometime teacher of American religious history, that the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh is not just any Jewish neighborhood. In fact, it's arguably the case that it is the oldest stable Jewish neighborhood in the United States and one of the oldest stable Jewish neighborhoods in the world. It has been substantially Jewish, though not a majority Jewish, about a third, for 100 years since it was settled around the time of World War I. That is not true of any other Jewish neighborhood you can name in the United States. 
whether you're thinking about Skokie, Illinois, or Newton or Brookline outside Boston, or the Lower East Side of New York, or Great Neck, or Beverly Hill, wherever you're thinking of, it was, if it was Jewish 100 years ago, it's not as Jewish now. And if it's heavily Jewish now, it wasn't as Jewish 100 years ago. Most of these neighborhoods kind of rise and fall, and often they rose as safe havens for Jews after World War II. But Squirrel Hill had this substantial Jewish population going back until the time of the Great War, of World War I. And that meant that there were multi-generational Jewish families. There were institutions that had been in this neighborhood for a century. In this neighborhood, which also happens to be a dense, tightly knit, walkable, urban landscape, and it made me think that with all of those advantages, maybe this neighborhood would offer an interesting model of how you can cope and how you can meaningfully move through your grief in the aftermath of one of these mass killings, which unfortunately are all too common in the United States. So I began going to Squirrel Hill the month after the shooting. The shooting, again, was October 27th, 2018. Um, I began going in November. I made 32 trips there over about a year and a half. And I interviewed about 250 people. And my questions were, again, never about the killer and seldom about the victims, but really about how people on the periphery of the killing, in the sort of the concentric circles outside it, people who knew the victims, people who worked with one of them, people who lived a quarter mile or a half mile from the synagogue, how did it affect them? How were people's lives changed in the month or the year after all of the network cameras had come and gone? What happens to a community not in the day after a killing, but in the seasons after a killing like this. And I thought that maybe Squirrel Hill would be an especially useful place to study those, um, those happenings, those eventualities. So the book I produced is filled with all of these kind of unusual characters, right? Remember, it's not a book about the murderer or the murdered. It's a book about these other people who maybe didn't get all that attention from the national press, maybe who weren't investigated as much, but somehow whose lives were changed and were changed forever. So I want to read you again that brief passage. And where are we? OK. So this is a passage, again, a page and a half about a woman named Tammy Hepps, who was born in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, a suburb of Philadelphia, but had moved to Squirrel Hill in her 30s. Late, she was about 40 when this all happened. In her mid to late 30s, she had moved to Pennsylvania, to, uh, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania because she got obsessed with family genealogy, and her grandparents had been from the Pittsburgh area. She ended up liking it, stayed in Squirrel Hill, and became like a major mocker, like synagogue person, active in local Jewish genealogy circles, Jewish philanthropy circles, a volunteer in many neighborhood organizations. By this point, everybody knew Tammy Hepps. And in the day after the killing, and the 20, let's say the two days after the killing, she was everywhere. She was like, at the JCC comforting families of the victims. She was standing outside the synagogue saying psalms because one of the things you do for the dead while their bodies have yet to be buried is you read psalms near them to accompany their, their souls. Um, she helped draft a letter to President Trump asking that he not come to town. Um, he came, as you'll see. Um, and finally, like a day later, after having barely slept, she was on her way home to her house on Aylesboro Avenue, the street my dad grew up on, when this happened. When Tammy Hepps made a turn onto Murray Avenue, a truck pulled up in front of her. On the side of it were painted three curious words, crosses for losses. As Hepps remembered it, she looked into the truck and saw a pile of crosses in the back. They were all white, and on a quick count, she decided there were 11 crosses. As soon as she grasped what she was seeing, she was incensed. I thought to myself, you have got to be fucking kidding me, Hepps remembered. And I looked around, and no one else was there. And I thought, if I have to be the one to tell this guy he can't put crosses on the synagogue, I will be the one to tell him he can't put crosses on the synagogue. Hepps had no idea who this guy was with this kind of nerve. As she was figuring out what to say to him, trying to keep her cool, she saw on the front seat of his truck a pile of wooden six-pointed stars. She was relieved. I thought to myself, OK, what will happen is he's going to put the stars of David on the crosses, and it will be OK. Greg Zanus got out on the driver's side of the truck and approached Tammy Hepps. She looked him up and down. He was tired, unshaven, old. What was he doing here? Where did he come from? Then she looked down and saw his hands, and something became clear. I saw his hands were covered in white paint, Hepps remembered. 
It's like he painted these things overnight and didn't even have time to wash his hands. He told me his intention. He said to me, I made these things, got in my truck, and drove nine hours. There was white paint on his hands. He said to me, I've been driving the whole time. I don't even know the names of the people who died. I have to write their names on the stars. And then Tammy Hepps knew what she had to do. Her mother had emailed her the full list of the dead that morning, so she had the names on her phone. Remember, this is before anyone's been buried. The bodies are still being carried off to the morgue. She had the names on her phone. Joyce Feinberg, Richard Gottfried, Rose Malinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Bernice Simon, Sylvan Simon, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, Irv Younger. I brought up this list on my phone, and he said to me, can you please write these names in my notebook? When Hepps had written down all 11 names, she gave Greg Zamis's notebook back to him. Now she had a question for him. I said to him, why do you do this? He said there had been gun violence in his family, and this was his response. He said, you remember Parkland? I did that one. Remember Columbine? I did that one too. It had never occurred to me, Tammy Hepp said, that it was one person who had made it his life's work to drive around the country and do this. And at that moment, I realized that we were just another one on the list. So that was Greg Zanus, founder of Crosses for Losses. When he died uh, about a year ago, his obituary was in the New York Times. There'd been a story on him on 60 Minutes. He was kind of this famous guy, this evangelical Christian from Aurora, Illinois, who drove around the country planting crosses at the spot where people had died violently. And what was so interesting about him, it, well, I'll get to that in a second. First, let's turn to the slides. So this is the cover of the book. And it actually occurred to me months after we had selected this cover how spiritually significant it was. Because as you can, so this is, you can see it's somebody lighting a candle, right? You see in the upper left, there's a, a, a woman leaning down lighting a candle. This is the kind of spontaneous memorial garden that was created at outside Tree of Life, in the garden out front, in the, again, 24 to 48 hours after the deaths. And as you can see, it's made up of basically two ob kinds of objects, candles and flowers. Now, what's significant about that? Well, candles are the most important kind of ritual object in Judaism. We light candles on the anniversaries of our dead. Um, we light candles to bring in the Sabbath and to leave the Sabbath. We bring in candles to, light hol to begin holidays and leave holidays. Candles are very important in Judaism. Flowers are not. Flowers are, are, a, are a Christian idiom. Christians tend to have flowers at funerals, and it's very important to have flowers at weddings. It's not necessarily religiously commanded, but it's, it seems spiritually significant in the Christian and American idiom. So when you have a garden like this that is filled with flowers and candles, what you're seeing is Christians and Jews coming together, each in their own way, to memorialize the victims. And that kind of ecumenical interfaith spirit ends up being very, very typical of the response in Squirrel Hill, as it might not be in other areas. And I was just so charmed that Jenny Caro, the book designer, without, I th without thinking about this, on some level kind of knew to do this. OK, so here's Greg Zanus, whom we were talking about. This is not him at Tree of Life. This is a different um, uh, site of a mass killing that he went to. You can see what he does. He builds these crosses. He paints their names in black of all the victims on them. Um, here, for some reason, it has a heart kind of underlying the cross. But what was typical of Greg Zanus was he always tried to make it specific to the spirituality of the victim. So he knew, as Tammy Hepps found out to her relief, that if it was a Jewish victim, it shouldn't foreground the cross. There should be a star of David, a six-pointed star over the cross. For Muslim victims, he knew to use a crescent moon. Um, he had different symbols for Sikhs and Hindus and Shintos and Baha'i. He had some symbol for atheists, for people who had identified in life as secularists or atheists, though I forget what symbol he used there. Maybe he just cut a big hole out and just said nothing. I don't know. <laughs> Um, you know the story about the joke about how you drive an atheist from the neighborhood, right? You burn a giant question mark on their lawn. I don't know. So anyway, so I've got obscure religious jokes all day. Okay, so here, he, so but this is Greg Zanus. He always was there in kind of a flannel shirt and a hard hat, and and wherever he went, he tried to customize and specify it to the dead, and that's kind of very kind of that that gesture. And by the way, he spent the last twenty years of his life almost entirely on the road. He traveled millions of miles. He went through four or five different pickup trucks, each of which he drove into the ground. He had a very, very supportive and tolerant wife. <laughs> he was basically, he retired from the construction business and spent his life 
doing this. And so it's not entirely surprising that this evangelical Christian would bump into the observant Jew, Tammy Hepps, outside Tree of Life on that day. Now, one of the things that happens in the aftermath of a mass killing is there's a, a profusion of visual culture, OK? So if you went to, um, to Pittsburgh, who, by the way, who here has seen this symbol? Can you raise your hand if you've seen this? Okay, so about half of you, right? This symbol, the stronger than hate icon with the Star of David, was, I wanted to find the origins of it. And I wasn't the first person. I always want to give credit where it's due. I was not the first person to discover who had made this, but I was pleased to kind of find the person who had found him and was able to put it in the book. This was created by a graphic designer named Tim Hines, not spelled like the ketchup, which is a Pittsburgh company, Hines Ketchup, but H-I-N-D-E-S, who was driving home on the morning of the shooting or early afternoon, listening to what had happened on the radio. And he just wanted to help. Uh, not a Jew, a kind of secular, lapsed, Lutheran, Gentile, Christian American. And he got home and he thought, you know what I can do? I can just use the talents I have. I'm a graphic designer. He fires up his Macintosh and he decides, I'm going to make a symbol that reflects the way that Pittsburgh embraces its Jews. So what am I going to use as the iconic image of Pittsburgh? How about the logo of the Pittsburgh Steelers? So he pulls up the Pittsburgh Steelers. He says, now I want to show that Pittsburgh embraces the Jews. How am I going to do that? I'm going to take one element of the Steelers logo and replace it with something Jewish. So he takes out the yellow hypocycloid. I learned that those are called hypocycloids, that geometric symbol. Um, for the geometers among us, it's a subset of the asteroid family. And he replaced it with a yellow Star of David. Then he took the word Steelers out. This is, of course, just this is what the Steelers helmet looks like, and replaces it with stronger than hate. And he posted it on Facebook, and within an hour, it had gone around the world approximately 7 trillion times. And the next day, people were holding it up at the Steelers game. The day after that, on, on Monday, every shop window in the Forbes and Murray Business District in Squirrel Hill had this poster in it. Within a week, the Steelers were wearing it on their cleats. People would put it on babies' onesies. They'd put it on yarmulkes. They'd put it on you know, everything. It became one of the defining images of the tragedy. Again, not created by a Jew, not even created by a Gentile from Squirrel Hill, but a suburban, lapsed Lutheran who just wanted to make a difference. Um, speaking of visual culture, the Friday after the killing, so five days later on the last day of funerals, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette editor David Shribman crafted this headline. Some of you will recognize it's the first line of the mourner's prayer, the mourner's Kaddish, reading right to left, Yit Kedal V'Yit Kedash Shemei Rabbah. It was Shribman's idea to do this. He called his rabbi, Jamie Gibson, at Temple Sinai, said, could you send me the Hebrew text of this? Sinai, uh, Gibson sent it over. Shribman brought it to his graphic designer who said, we don't have a Hebrew font that large. They had never run a Hebrew headline before. Why would they have? They're an English language American newspaper. Shribbin said, well, I guess we have to make one. So somehow, using Photoshop or whatever, they crafted this you know, 24 point or whatever, 48 point font typeface in Hebrew for this occasion, put it out there over a photograph of people in the rain lining up for one of the funerals. And the next day, it was on newsstands and kiosks and doorsteps across Pittsburgh. And people just broke down and sobbed. It was so perfect. It fit the day so, so beautifully. And again, became one of these iconic images of the killing. But nothing more iconic and nothing more American than a, a Starbucks window, right? Um, this is the, there are two Starbucks in Squirrel Hill, for those of you who are Pittsburghers. This is the one at the corner of Forbes and Shady. Uh, it's kind of the more centrally located of the two. And this art here, I just every time I saw it, I kind of stopped and, and, and gaped. Uh, it's, it's three Jewish scriptural images, the Star of David. Actually, that's not a scriptural image, but it's Jewish in its way. Star of David, the Tree of Life, and the Dove, with the Hebrew words Ahava, Chesed, and Tikva underneath, love, kindness, and hope. How did it get there? Um, now, this is a, a Starbucks frequented by observant Jews, Orthodox Jews. None of them created this. No, the lapsed Presbyterian manager of the Starbucks, Melissa Lizot, called her friend, the Roman Catholic artist Nicole Flannery, and said, can you do something for my Jewish customers? And Nicole Flannery said, well, I don't know what, but I'll figure it out. She talked to a local Orthodox Jewish man whom someone had connected her with. They came up with this scheme. He taught her how to do the Hebrew lettering. By the Tuesday after the killing, this was up there. And it's now become just this iconic part of the, the visual you know, landscape of Squirrel Hill. People walk by it and just stop and stare. And, and it's been left up there. It's still there years later. And I love the idea that 30 years from now, there will be teenagers sitting at the big long table inside the Starbucks looking at the reverse images of this as they sip their frappuccinos and saying, like, what is that? 
and there will be an occasion for the constant retelling of the story of the 11 who were killed that morning. Before we leave behind the visual stories, I just want to point out this photograph. It's a bad photograph because I took it, which is why the composition is terrible and everything about it's terrible, except the message in it, which is, um, so this is, this is the Squirrel Hill sign at the base of Forward Avenue when you get off the interstate um, as you ascend up toward Murray and go into the Squirrel Hill district. And you can see this is a little Star of David hanging from the H. There were thousands of these around Pittsburgh, little Stars of David made of of foil paper or popsicle sticks or paper mache or knitting that were, that were hung by this team of volunteers who, who collected them all from around the world, organized a, a cadre of volunteers on Facebook, and one day, I think it was in December, fanned out across the city and hung these Stars of David made by children and, and their parents from around the world from you know, the toes of statues, from street lamps, from street signs, um, from everywhere from the, the, the needles of, of pine trees. And this was in March that I took this photo after the winter had destroyed most of these Stars of David. It was one of the last ones in the whole city. I ended up finding it in the mud about two weeks later. That, that ribbon had finally broken, and so I saved it. Um, it's at my house back home. But again, just this testament to the way that an event happening in Pittsburgh can actually bring people together from around the world. This is a photograph that I include. I don't know who these men are. I don't know whose body is in the hearse, but it's one of the 11 dead. And I love this photograph because, as you can see, these are Orthodox Jews who are walking behind the, um, the, the hearse who are acting as shomrim, as guards. That's an Orthodox tradition, that you don't let the body go unattended from the time that it dies of death until the body is interred in the ground. And there weren't enough secular and reform and conservative Jews in Pittsburgh to do the guarding of 11 bodies. So the Orthodox stepped up, even though none of the 11 killed was Orthodox. And they were acting as shomrim. They also helped clean the bodies. Uh, there's a whole religious ritual that goes into um, how, you, how you bury the body, how it's cleaned. And in fact, there's a tradition that all the organic matter from the body should get a proper burial. So they were part of teams that went into the synagogue and carefully scraped the blood and the brain tissue from the walls, from the carpets, collected it, and gave it its own burial. One of the other things that happens after a mass killing is that money rolls in. People want to write checks. They want to give from around the world. They just a way of helping as they can, they can do that. And the local Jewish Federation of Pittsburgh collected uh, several million dollars. The three synagogues that were affected, Tree of Life and the two tenant congregations that rented space and lost members as well, also got money from GoFundMe campaigns. But this guy, Shai Khatiri, a lapsed Muslim Iranian immigrant, striving right now to get his American citizenship, got up that morning on Saturday, heard on the news what had happened, went to his local coffee shop in Washington, DC, where he lived, he's not a Pittsburgher, and opened up a GoFundMe page to raise money for the Jews of the Tree of Life killing. And within a day, they'd raised something like 50 or $100,000, and within a week, it, had, it was about $1.5 million. He is the largest individual fundraiser for Pittsburgh Jewelry um, in the aftermath of this killing anywhere in the world. And he's like a late 20s, lapsed Muslim, Iranian master's student living in Washington, DC, who had never met anybody from Pittsburgh. When I asked for a photo of him to include in the book, he sent this photograph of himself standing in front of the White House and holding up Plato's Republic, <laughs> as if to say, I love the West. <laughs> Inside that Starbucks that day, a group of teenagers from Alderdice High School had gathered to plan a vigil that evening at the end of Shabbat, at the end of Saturday, which would be partly a religious ceremony, the Havdalah ceremony marking the end of the Sabbath with the three-stranded braided candle that some of you will recognize. Uh, it was an interfaith group, mostly female, high school seniors meeting at Starbucks. Within five hours, they'd planned one of the largest vigils the city had ever seen. Here's Emily Pressman on the left, Jewish. On the right, um, Isabel Smith, African-American, non-religious but ancestrally Christian. They were two of the planners. And what they pulled together was this, uh, thousands of people turning out that evening to sing the Havdalah prayers and remember the victims. What's also important about this photograph that you wouldn't necessarily know is that it's taken from the steps of Sixth Presbyterian Church, which, as no doubt you know, was the home church of Mr. Rogers 
TV's Mr. Rogers, an ordained Presbyterian minister who somehow found his way into children's television, but was a lifelong congregant of his local Presbyterian church in Squirrel Hill. It is significant that when Fred Rogers sat down to create the iconic television show, which some of you know in its animated form of Daniel Tiger, um, when he sat down to create the iconic television show about, about a safe neighborhood where children could play freely and safely and give free range to their imaginations, um, could live in a fantasy land but also in reality and move back and forth between the two with joy, he looked out his window and saw Squirrel Hill where he lived and based his show on that neighborhood. As I said earlier, politicians also come in the aftermath of a mass killing. They're kind of expected to, though probably less so in these days when there are so many of them. And Donald Trump announced uh, he was coming. And on the Tuesday after the killing, he came. He met with Rabbi Jeffrey Myers of Tree of Life. Uh, and he, he brought along uh, the former First Lady, Melania Trump. And here they are standing outside of uh, Tree of Life. There were many people who thought that Rabbi Myers should not meet with President Trump. And there were others who felt that the principle of hospitality required that he meet with President Trump. And he ended up meeting with President Trump for a little while. Also important in this photograph, as you can see, finally, what Gregory Zanus did with the crosses for losses. He put these stars of David on the front of them with the names of the dead, including the Christian symbols of the crosses. So you can see Sylvan Simon and Bernice Simon. That was a married couple that was killed um, in the same room where they'd been married 60 years earlier. Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, so forth. At the protest against President Trump's coming, thousands of people gathered. In fact, one person said to me, I think it might have been the largest gathering of Jews in Pittsburgh history. <laughs> and if you think about it, there were probably more Jews there than there were on any given Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur at any given synagogue. So yeah, if you put them all in one place to pro protest President's, uh, President Trump's visit, you get a lot of Jews and, and non-Jews as well. How did they protest against the President's visit? they decided to enact the mourning ritual of Korea. Um, some of you will know that when you lose a relative in Judaism, when you lose someone close to you, the tradition historically was that you tear your garment. These days, they will often give you um, a black ribbon, which you will pin to your garment, and then you tear the black ribbon. What they decided to do was hand out pieces of black paper and then go silent. And when a sign was given, they would all hold their paper up to the sky and tear it all at once as a sign of grief and, and kind of anger and mourning over the fact that Trump, whom they held partly accountable for the killing, had come to their neighborhood. For some reason, I guess, you know, my, my eyes always go to this woman here holding up the piece of paper. I don't think she was any leader of the march in any way or anything, but this is, I, I always see her face when I think about, when I think about this protest. Uh, some people were less subtle. Um, I include this photograph somewhat ambivalently because it's actually fairly atypical of, of that day. It was a very, very nonviolent protest and, and, and peaceful in spirit as well as in deed. There was one arrest, and it wasn't for anything violent. This is Professor Josh Bloom, who's a sociologist at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he sat down in front of the Trump motorcade and began meditating and refused to get out of the way, and he was taken away by Pittsburgh police. And as he was careful to emphasize to me, he was treated well, released the next day, and no charges were pressed. In the aftermath of a killing, celebrities like to come. Uh, Jeremy Piven was in town. He stopped by Tree of Life. Um, lots of other celebrities. Tom Hanks was in town. And here he has his arm around um, First Lady Joanne Rogers, the wife of Mr. Rogers, uh, the widow of Mr. Rogers. Now, the football fans here will know whose luscious head of white hair this is under the black yarmulke. Who is that? Robert Kraft, exactly, the owner of the New England Patriots. Uh, when the Patriots were in town to play the Steelers on Sunday, Kraft, who grew up in an observant Jewish home, um, came to the, where, the, the space where Tree of Life is now meeting um, to attend services. There was a bar mitzvah that day. And he came, and he gave two tickets to his owner's box at Steelers Stadium next day to the boy and his family. and. Um, amazingly put on the Stronger Than Hate Pittsburgh Steelers yarmulke. And I thought to myself, this surely is the first time in history that the owner of the New England Patriots has worn any garb referencing AFC rivals, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I would not normally take my phone out in shul, but I thought that God, God's self, was commanding me to record Patriots owner wearing Pittsburgh Steelers garb. This could destroy him. This could ruin him. 
But of course, Robert Kraft has survived bigger scandals than that. So he's, <laughs> he's fine. Um, one of the other things that comes to a neighborhood that the media also often misses in the aftermath of a mass killing is, um, is puppies, animals, dogs. Uh, we live in a culture of therapy dogs and support animals. In the case of one set of dogs I met, they were referred to by their owners as canine advocates. And they were everywhere. People brought dogs from, I met and interviewed a woman from New Jersey who brought her dogs to the eight hours distance to Pittsburgh, her dachshunds, her six therapy dachshunds. I would not find it comforting to be around dachshunds, after the two, which I find to be a small, yappy breed of dog, but they are trained therapy dachshunds. But this is, I don't know which dogs these are. I know only that they're wearing the red vest that seems to be ubiquitous on comfort animals. And here, and I'm a dog person, so the more dogs in any book I write, the better. And I'm just, I actually, part of me wanted this cover, this to be the cover of my book, but it, it's a little too complicated a photo to, to really hit on first look. But if you look at this, this is a, a girl wearing a raincoat, petting a dog. And if you look at the, um, the card in her hand, which she's made for the police, it says, thank you for keeping the Jews in my neighborhood safe, Lily, age six. And I, I just like, I just lose it every time I see this. It's, this, it's so, um, it so evokes what I saw. Again, I didn't get there this soon after the killing. But even when I got there a little bit later, it so evokes the kind of spirit and the way that people find comfort and joy even in dark times. The fact that she's making a card to thank the first responders who, who had, in some cases, were shot, in shot and survived, but were shot in responding to this crime. It was it's sort of everything. And the last photo that I want to show you is, um, is the photo uh, of this guy, Robert Zacharias. And Robert Zacharias is a really, really interesting figure because um, he's this guy I met very, very early in my research because he was quoted in some article. He'd been at some event in the aftermath of the killing. And um, I was sort of intrigued, and I thought, I'm going to call him. I was still look It was early enough that I was looking for people to interview. I didn't have lots of references. You know, within a week or two, I had a notebook full of hundreds of names, that I never, some of which I never got to. But Robert Zacharias was this incredibly interesting guy who, in the aftermath of the killing, that day, he decided, I'm going to go. He saw online that the teenagers whom you met earlier were holding a vigil that night. He's a kind of a reformed Jew, um, pretty secular. Grew up in New Jersey, went to a large reformed temple. And he decided, you know, I want to go do something Jewish. I'm going to go to their Havdalah event at the corner of Forbes and Murray at the intersection. And he was one of the thousands of people there. But before he went, he reached deep into his closet, and he found a yarmulke. Now, a lot of Jewish males have that one yarmulke that's like deep in the closet that you got at somebody's bar mitzvah somewhere. And so it has that person's name on the inside. It's like, you know, Jordan Shapiro, right, August 7th, you know, 2017, and you've saved that one suede yarmulke for, for just such a time as this, right? So he pulls out that yarmulke and he puts it on. He says, I should wear it, right? I'm going to go to It's a Jewish thing. I'm going to go. He goes, he wears it to that big vigil. Then he, there's a party he's going to afterwards, like, a, you know, a rager, a kegger, I don't know. He's going to some party, not related to the killing, not related to Judaism, but he leaves the yarmulke on. And then the next morning, he gets up, and he says, you know what, I'm going to wear my yarmulke today. He puts the yarmulke on. And the next day, he puts the yarmulke on, and the day after that. And when I met him, a couple months later, he was still wearing the yarmulke. And by the way, today, he still is. I saw him a couple months ago when I was in Pittsburgh. He's wearing the yarmulke. I don't know that he's now going to synagogue with any regularity. I don't think he's keeping kosher. I don't think he's taken on any other commandments or mitzvot. He's just doing this one thing to be a little bit more visibly Jewish. And in so many ways, that encapsulates the kind of thing I saw in Squirrel Hill. Not that everyone was becoming more visibly Jewish. In fact, many of the people I write about are not Jews. It's that everyone's life changed somehow, and usually in ways that are not publicly visible. You know. You have Robert Zacharias, who's now dressing differently. You had Lynn Hyde, a woman who was married to a Jewish guy, had always thought maybe she'd become Jewish, maybe she'd convert. But when she heard the sirens going past her house on that morning and then found out where they were going, within a day, she had decided, I think I'm going to go through with it. I think those are my people who were just attacked. I want to become fully Jewish. And she ended up converting. And, and it all happened during COVID. And it was quite a trial. And she's now um, a Jew. I think about the anonymous people who dropped challah on the doorsteps of people who they thought needed comfort food in the days after the killing. People I interviewed who were baking and then delivering challahs around 
Squirrel Hill. I think of the people who raised money and never got credit. In so many ways, these small little acts, some of which are kind of classical acts of kindness, some of which are just acts of like personal piety or remembrance, but don't necessarily affect anyone else, are typical of what I saw in the aftermath of this killing. And here's what I wanted to say. I think they're more likely to happen, and I think more of them happen, in a neighborhood like Squirrel Hill, where every time people left their door, they bumped into other people who understood what they had gone through. So many American mass killings happen at suburban strip malls or at cineplexes, at big movie theaters, where the only thing that the people in the audience have in common is they all decided to go see that Marvel superheroes movie that day. But one person comes from 20 miles in that direction, one from 20 miles in that direction. Their families don't know each other. They're of different religions, different communities, different political persuasions. They're just different, and they have nothing in common. And there's no community around the loss of them. In fact, quite to the contrary, in a lot of communities, when money is raised, people are at each other's throats fighting over who gets the money. A lot of times there's survivor's guilt, there's despair, there's suicide. In Squirrel Hill, there was none of that. Really what there was was people coming together to help each other. And I think that has everything to do with it being the kind of historically rooted, multi-generational, tight-knit, walkable, sound urban neighborhood that Squirrel Hill is. And I think that when you have such a neighborhood, you increase the opportunity not to eradicate sadness, because the sadness is unquestionable, but you increase the opportunity that people can walk through that sadness and get to a place where they don't just survive, but also thrive. Thank you. So I wonder if there are, we have time for questions. Yeah. What can I tell you? Who has a question? Did you have one? Was that your hand? Yeah. No? Sorry, you were just waving. We have a question right here. No, she doesn't have a question, but down here we have one. Hi. Wait, wait for the microphone so the people in Zoom land can hear you. The Zoomies, as I call them. Oh, oh there we go. There we go. Um, hi, my name is Julia. Uh, I had a question actually about sort of the process of writing and reporting for this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious how you. First of all, like you keep track sort of everything that you're getting as you go through this process, and also, how were your ideas about what you wanted, you know, your end, you know, book to look like? Did that change over time as you were finding out new information, and did you ever have to like, go back to people to ask them new questions along that journey? You so, you sound like a writer. I uh, yes. Yes, I, I love getting craft questions. I you've made me so happy. I never get questions about the craft of writing. Yeah, uh, it's actually like, it's actually what I find the most interesting thing to talk about. Um, but I understand that most people come to, because they're interested in this, and I'm interested in this as well. But for me, actually, there's a way in which the story I've told is simpler than how hard it was to tell it from the inside of it. And so I love that question. Um, so the first, there were two parts. The first was, how did I keep track of everything? Right. So I don't have any masterful, <laughs> like, <laughs> This, those of you who have been doctoral students you, as well, like any of you who has ever been engaged in sustained research, you know that you have that friend who has a system, right? They have that. They have like special proprietary software you've never heard of, and they have. You know, in grad school, it was always the people who, instead of having actual note cards, they had four thousand note cards on a note-taking program, and they had twelve hundred screen windows open on. They had like three monitors that they'd all synced up so that literally like they could use their cursor to get from one monitor over to the third in real and and they could you know they could do rich text searches within their notes and i just always like bought lots of 3 by 5 cards and wrote stuff down and then kind of shuffled them and made piles i'm still basically that person um, i'm perfectly adept with technology obviously i write on a word processor <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a computer literate human but i find nothing beats just having a lot of piles of stuff. So what do I do? Um, I record all the interviews I can. I transcribe them. I also, there is some good, the, the artificial intelligence has gotten good enough with certain programs. I use something called Temi, T-E-M-I dot com, where you can upload the audio file and it can return it to you at a fair, like a few cents a page, basically nothing money-wise, with like 80% accuracy and it always gets the Jewish words wrong. <laughs> So like, it gets everything right except like chutzpah, pesadich, you know, like schnorrer. I mean, there's just, you could like spot the Jewish words it gets wrong throughout. So I do that, and then I end up with like 
200 interviews of 10 or 20 pages each, so that's a few thousand pages. I also, the whole time, have taken a lot of notes um, and have, um, so I have like another, and I've typed some notes, so I have another maybe 1,000 pages of less like Word documents, and then I print out everything, and then I read through everything. So there's like a week of like reading all the stuff. And as I'm reading through it, about halfway through it, I realize there's some themes that are emerging, and I start coding stuff with numbers at tops. But the numbers are like, number one, you know, Greg Zanus and crosses for number two, money, number three, you know, dogs. And then I go through it a second time and put stuff in piles, and those piles become my chapters. <laughs> How's that for Is that simplistic enough? <laughs> like, it's really. So, and then, yeah, the, the, and, and the, this, the idea of what story I thought I was going to tell changed all the time. I had no, I, I would say, I would say a year into a two-year reporting project, or a year into an 18-month reporting project, I began to see the outline of what it was going to look like. Yeah, I began to have a sense of like a dozen chapter ideas, and some of those stayed and some changed and ended up being 18 chapters. So that was, that was how it went. But I will happily talk more about with, after if you want. Thanks. What else could I tell you? Do you have other questions? We have one there, we have one here. Yes, sir. Okay, Mark, uh, you made uh, 32 trips there. Yes. Okay, and uh, you talked to a lot of people. Are you from Pittsburgh? Are you? Are you no, from Pittsburgh? Sir. I'm, I'm local. Oh, OK. okay. You okay. had that way about you, like you were about to say, I know Pittsburgh. <laughs> like, you might have made 32 trips, but I'm from there. OK. Because I get that okay. a lot. OK, gotcha. OK, but sorry, okay. go ahead. All right, so OK. Um, so you interviewed a lot of people. Yeah. And um, number two questions. Number one question, um, uh, what, what were there many friends that you made, and what what, what what people, either men or women or age group, were most receptive oh, that's a good question. Uh, to your questions? And the bonus question is, um, you said you were there to, to uh, survey the changes. What about the changes with Mark? Uh, OK. The bonus question. All right, bonus question. You'll tell me if I forget any of your questions, because I'm sort of Mr. Short-Term Memory Man. Um, uh, who was most receptive? Was that the first one? Yeah. So honestly, everyone was really receptive. Teens were receptive. I didn't get them in the book enough, actually, although I do have a great chapter about the, the, the tension at Alderdice High School, High School on the Monday after the killing. Um, but teens were receptive. Parents were receptive. Uh, older people were receptive. I, honestly, 95, 90 to 95% of the people I saw, whom I asked to talk to me, with me talked with me. It was very moving. Um, did I make? And that's not atypical in journalism. People generally want to tell their stories, which is nice. Um, I think that the early people I talked to had good experiences with me. They found me not to be mean or confrontational and probably said nice things about me to other people. Like, word gets around. Um, about a year into the process, there were a couple of people who stopped talking to me, and I don't really know why. I don't know what reasons they had. That's not unusual. Did I make friends? Um, there is nobody whom I still regularly email or text with or talk to. I mean, Robert and I, like when we saw each other in Pittsburgh, he was at my book signing, and you know, I think we hugged, though it was kind of COVID times, but he was there with his girlfriend Molly, whom I got to know a little bit. And I would say that if we were in the same town, we would, you know, hang out once in a while. I mean, he's we we really connected. Um, either other people have reached out to me, other people have reached out for various things, but no, like none of them is among my top hundred friends. You know, they're subjects. And that, by the way, can sometimes be a painful thing because you, you dip into people's lives, they get very connected to you, sometimes you to them, and then you disappear from them and move on to the next project. It's, it can feel very transactional and very cold. Bonus, changes in me. No, I would say that, um, you know, I am, I am pretty temperamentally well-suited to going into very, very painful journalistic fields. I was talking earlier um, with Professor Griffith about how I'd studied um, uh, sexual abuse. I've written about sexual abuse in religious communities a lot. I've written about some dark stuff. I've never done war report. I've never seen anyone die. You know, there's, there are things I haven't seen, but, I've, but I have seen and heard a different set of dark things. And it doesn't tend to, um, as far as I can tell, affect me very much, except to just kind of give me more gratitude for my own good fortune. Um, one of the points I always want to make is that as hard as it is to go in and interview people who have lost you know, relatives to mass murder. Um, it's nothing compared to what 
nurses and hospital chaplains and police officers and firefighters and soldiers and, and in many cases public school teachers deal with often. There's so many jobs where you're so often encountering pain and suffering and human frailty. Journalism is pretty far down on the list. <laughs> Most of my stories that I get to pick are pretty cheery, stories of human triumph, fun, humorous. Like uh, The percentage of my work that goes into the very, very ugly side of human nature is actually pretty small. So you know, there, there were times that I had very sad days, but I wouldn't say that I ever got depressed, for example. You had a question. You had a question. Yes, let's wait for the microphone. These are great questions, by the way. Worcester, great questions. <laughs> Um, I was just curious, you were talking in the beginning about kind of struggling with the idea of coming and turning a tragedy into work. Yeah. I'm curious how you came to terms with that in the end. I mean, I struggled with it a little bit only because this one was so personal because it's my dad's old neighborhood. I mean, Aylesboro Avenue is, you know, a, a, few, a quarter mile from the Tree of Life synagogue. And, you know, I stay, when I would go, I would stay with my aunt Elise, who still lives in Squirrel Hill. You know, this one felt almost like I was reporting on family, and I worried that I would not have the objective detachment to do it. But ultimately, I decided that I could and that I would. The general ethical question of the fact that journalists um, often you know, make money and, and get notoriety and win prizes um, using the suffering of others is something I don't, that doesn't trouble me much. I think it's really important. It is a truth. I mean, the same, you could say, you could play that game with any, you could say, well, hospital trauma surgeons make a living because other people get shot. I mean, lots of us are in industries that, in some sense, would go away if people lived forever, forever and peaceably, <laughs> right? Um, journalism is a pretty important one, and I think that um, we need more coverage of, of terrible human events, and we need to understand them better, and we need to be made more aware of them. And so I don't, um, I'm quite proud to be part of a guild that does that. You have two, you have three on right here, behind you, right in front of you, and behind you on the other side. Hi, Mark. I introduced myself yes. to you earlier as a Squirrel Hill native. Yes. Uh, it was my observation, and it's just maybe more of an opinion, that uh, having, I left Squirrel Hill in 1983 when I went, went off to college, and uh, I always thought coming back that it seemed like the Jewish influence in Squirrel Hill had waned over time, but that was just my opinion. As I saw my friends and family either move to the suburbs or what I would consider to be greater Squirrel Hill, like Shadyside or mm -hmm. Point Breeze. And uh, I just wanted to know if you thought this tragedy was gonna have any impact on you know, the Jewish influence in Squirrel Hill and what kind of impact it might have, right. might have going forward. So if I'm not mistaken, your argument is basically that your neighborhood peaked at the moment you were last there. <laughs> so the, no, I, no, I would The say golden peak. age was when you were there. No, no. I'm I would just say teasing. The, no, I know. The, but the, it yes. probably was already declining, no, 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 no. the Jewish so influence. Uh, this is a very Jewish good question. Okay. One thing that is undoubtedly true is that the Jewishness of the shopping district, which is a really, really meaningful thing, right? If you're in a neighborhood, what, what makes a neighborhood feel Jewish or Chinese American or African American or queer, right? To a great extent, it's the shops, right? It's that, you know, is there a bookstore that sells Judaica or that sells, you know, gay and lesbian literature or that sells Spanish language? Like, that tells you a lot about the, qual the, the, the quality of, of the, the feel of the neighborhood, right? Um, like, what is the, the kind of sensibility of the neighborhood? Who lives there, right? Um, and Squirrel Hill in, say, 1960, for example, was, and, and, and less so in 83, but even less so today, was a neighborhood of delis and kosher, bu kosher butchers and Jewish bakeries and Judaica stores and, uh, you know, Jewish-owned clothing stores, like, which had Jewish names attached to them. Um, so you felt you were basically, that the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the tailor, the cobbler were all Jews. And that wasn't as true in 1983 as it was in, say, 1950 or 1960, when it was so true. But it was truer in 83 than it is today, when it's still a perfectly lovely shopping district, but with a lot more chain stores and a little less kind of Jewish soul to the neighborhood. That's for sure. Um, in terms of the population, you are right that, that the, there's been a bit of a diaspora to other East End neighborhoods, like Greenfield and Point Breeze and Regent Square. Um, there's still a lot of Jews in those places. A lot of times, non-Orthodox Jews feel like when they when they say a neighborhood is Jewish, what they mean is Jews like me. And if they see a lot of Orthodox, like black hat or Hasidic Jews, they feel like, well, okay, but that's, that's not what I want. I want like secular Jews eating corned beef. <laughs> you know, and it is true. The neighborhood is more Orthodox and a little less kind of 
reformy, conservative, mainstream American-y Jewy in the way that my audiences often have nostalgia for. Um, and that is true. Um, so yeah, neighborhoods, neighborhoods change. But to your question, I don't see, I have not heard any evidence that people are more or less likely to come since the killing. I think there's definitely an initial upsurge of kind of neighborhood pride in the aftermath, for sure. So we had here and here. Thanks so much. Uh, oh, wait, can I interrupt? Everywhere I go, someone who grew up in Squirrel Hill turns out to hear me talk. And it's actually the nicest thing. It turns out I am the Pied Piper for ex Pittsburghers. <laughs> Wherever I go, Pittsburgh diaspora shows up just to say hi. And sometimes they see other people whom they know everywhere. And if there's five people, one of them will be from Pittsburgh. And sometimes, as in South Hadley, Massachusetts, Pittsburghers who knew each other from there but didn't know they were both from Pittsburgh discover on rising to ask me questions that they both grew up in Pittsburgh. And I just, I, it's like this special superpower I have now that I didn't, I, I didn't seek it out. And yet, you know, sometimes what is it? The wand chooses the wizard, right? I mean, here I am. OK, sorry. Uh, we have a very deep connection with Squirrel Hill insofar as our house is on a hill and we have a lot of squirrels. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, There's unconnected to the yeah. Squirrel Hill that you're yeah. dealing with here. Uh, this is a presentation that is just so deeply and heartwarmingly coming together and sharing. And my question is very simply, uh, in your extensive contact, uh, extensive experience writing this book, did you not come across anything that was anti-Semitic, that was angry, that pushed back against, and that was really not interested in having you around doing what you were doing? No. No, I didn't meet any anti-Semites in my reporting. But they wouldn't necessarily have known me or sought me out. I mean, um, you know, some of the worst anti-Semites are Jews, and, I, and some of the worst anti-journalists are Jews. I mean, wherever I go, the people who are usually meanest to me are fellow Jews who have some problem with the way I've portrayed their community. But, that, that's what it is to be a journalist, uh, is that your own community gets maddest at you. And uh, you have to kind of wear that a little bit as, you know, as a hair shirt. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't find any, um, I didn't encounter any, the, the anti-Semitism I encountered was the, the memory of what had happened October 27th, 2018. I didn't encounter any while I was there. Um, over last weekend, I think, there were some anti-Semitic flyers distributed in uh, Squirrel Hill, and apparently outside Sherry Torah on Lower Murray Avenue, someone yelled some some obscenity directed at Orthodox people going in there. So, you know, there are, it, it, Squirrel Hill, like all Jewish communities, is experiencing um, it, it experiences anti-Semitism, whether it's an uptick or not, is kind of you know people debate about. But um, but America is still largely free of public anti-Semitism compared to many other countries, and that remains true. So no, it was, it was a really pleasant reporting experience in that way. Yeah. Uh, thank you, I have two questions. Um, first of all, uh, would you say there's a difference in response? Or like how did, say, the Orthodox versus non-Orthodox -com community respond mm -hmm. to this? And then how would you, and I don't know if you covered this in the book much, how would you say people who live in Pittsburgh and Squirrel Hill who are not Jewish, how did this say affect them as compared to Jews who have no connection to Pittsburgh? Right. Um, that's a really, really good question. Um, so the second was people who are not Jewish in Pittsburgh. How did Pittsburgh Gentiles react? Right. OK, so let me take the second one first. The, the, the rather stark and sad fact is that everybody moves on. Right. So if I am talking to a Gentile from, uh, from Pittsburgh or greater Pittsburgh, or if I'm talking to a Jew from Spokane, Washington, to pick one perfectly nice place. And I say I'm writing a book on uh, you know, what happened in Pittsburgh in 2018. Both of them are likely to say, why? What happened in Pittsburgh in 2018? Most people move on. Okay? The people who don't move on are people who had a special connection to this event, people who are engaged in Jewish communal work, people who, Jews who live in Squirrel Hill, et cetera. The reality is that in a country that's had hundreds of mass killings since Columbine in 1999, and if you were 22 or 23 years old, you have literally lived exactly contemporaneously with the era of mass killings in America, right? starting with Columbine in 1999. Um, there have been so many that most people forget most of them. If you asked me to name cities in which there had been a mass killing in the, in the United States, and I just wrote a book on a mass killing in the United States, I could probably name eight or nine cities. I wonder if any of you could do better. Right? I could name Orlando, and Charleston, and Las Vegas, and 
I could give you five others. Most people could not give you more than 10, which is to say we move on. That is actually very healthy and highly adaptive. I do not expect the world to remember this particular killing as I don't expect the world to remember any particular killing. And I think that that's healthy. Um, it's also kind of heartbreaking and sad. Um, the first question was how did Gentiles in Pittsburgh, what was the first question? So, I mean, the Orthodox community has more experience. First of all, they have more Hever Kadishas, more groups of people who know how to take care of dead bodies. So they were very active in that. They had kind of certain resources that could spring into action because they tend to have a more do-it-yourself attitude toward a lot of aspects of Jewish mourning and Jewish ritual. So they know how to do shomrim, how to follow bodies to the grave. They know how to um, take care of dead bodies. So do many non-Orthodox Jews, especially in Pittsburgh, which is a really robust um, tradition of non-Orthodox Jews doing these things that in most places are Orthodox practices now. Um, but um, the other thing is that a lot of Orthodox Jews are very attentive to, if they're modern Orthodox especially, um, to uh, terror against Jews in Israel and France and other places. So they tend not to be as surprised. They are less, um, I would say, uh, yoked to this tragedy as somehow the emblematic Jewish tragedy because if they have relatives living in you know, the West Bank, they're used to lots of Jewish tragedies, and usually one every year or so that really you know, sticks. So I would say that there was um, more of a sense of, here we go again. How can we be useful? It was a little bit more of a, um, in a I would say, blasé in a good sense, which is to say that, it's, that the practices around it are more natural to people who are completely embedded or highly embedded in a Jewish world in America than to highly assimilated or secularized Jews for whom this was like a shock. They thought, how could this happen to Jews? Well, again, if you have relatives in Orthodox communities around the world and you're in touch with them regularly on WhatsApp, you're not surprised that this happens to Jews. So that was the big distinction. I think I have time for two more questions, and then we will take the re Oh, my god. I'll say three more, and I'll be brief, and then I'll take the rest of them at the schmooze afterwards. OK. No, it's my job to be brief. You can be loquacious, and I'll be brief. How did there um, come to be a Jewish community in Squirrel Hill? Oh, uh, how did there come to be a Jewish community in School Hill? So uh, the Jewish community in Pittsburgh, the, the graveyard was first purchased in 1847. That's when you know Jews are staying, when they build a ritual bath and get a graveyard. Um, and they largely lived in the western side of the city, um, downtown Allegheny City, places like that, until Squirrel Hill was settled after 1900. Um, initially, they couldn't settle Squirrel Hill because it was hilly. It's very hard to get the streetcars there. It was just a hard place to settle. Um, but they, the technology got better, and finally some non-Jewish real estate developers began building houses, and they became popular with Jews who moved in from downtown and also from East Liberty, which was a somewhat earlier Jewish settlement, if you know the town at all. It was largely just like the continued expansion of Pittsburgh. Why Jews were going to Squirrel Hill in particular uh, at a time when you know, they had other enclaves, I'm actually not entirely sure how it initially got going. But it very quickly had synagogues and had a, a commercial infrastructure that kept drawing Jews. Um, we'll go here, and then, and then here. Um, so you talked about how um, one of the unique aspects of the recovery of the like Jewish community in Squirrel Hill was that they had a community around them that deeply understood what everyone was going through. So I guess my question is, in your interviews, did anyone actually talk about that aspect? Like, did the people who were going through the recovery process, were they aware of that? Or was that something that you gleaned from doing all of these interviews? Yeah, no, they were highly aware of it. And, and what was interesting was some of them were aware of it as a, as a formal thing, which is to say that there, um, JFCS, uh, Jewish Family and Community Services, which is the big Jewish social work agency there, had a very, very strong presence. Some government money came in. This is a very interesting story. There's millions of dollars available in government money if you're the victim, if your community is victimized by a terrorist attack. And so that money came in to set up a new social service agency that they called the 1027 Healing Partnership. So they were running events. The Jewish social work agency was running events. The Center for Victims, another nonprofit, was running events. So there was a, a kind of big like nonprofit structure that helped a lot of people grieve. But then, of course, people who were already embedded in, in the Jewish community because they belonged to a synagogue um, or maybe a Jewish book club or whatever, they had a Jewish tie, they were leaning on those ties that they already had. So there was kind of a formal structure of people being brought together to help each other grieve. And then there were all these informal ties as well, so kind of like parallel tracks 
Um, all of which, by the way, become much, much harder if people live in kind of like far-flung, suburbanized car culture neighborhoods. I mean, all of it in some ways relied on the fact that Squirrel Hill is this compact, walkable, bikeable, you know, urban uh, community. But yes, they were, there was a lot of awareness at the time of how they were, of how they were different in, in, in helpful ways. And this gentleman here in the plaid gets the last question for now, and then we're all going to go eat and drink. It's going to be so much fun. Um, I, I, I remember the symbolism of uh, love and hope, and I forgot the third word in, on the... It was chesed. It was kindness. Kindness. Yeah. Um, how, do we, um, how do we move forward as a society? And this also applies to um, the, the, uh, the world fighting uh, uh, Putin, who, who's being as bad or worse as Hitler. How, how do we, in our own United States community, it seems like we've gone from um, occasional mass shootings or lynchings or firebombing churches mm -hmm. from 1910 to 1940, um, what, you know, what, whatever the target uh, was, it's, it's, it's increasing. We, we have more division. Char Charleston, where... Um, I think uh, seven people were executed. Yeah, nine, yeah. By, by, by a crazy person. Yeah. The, 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 the families of, of those victims forgave the person who did it. Um, and, and Judaism has uh, uh, love and kindness, and Christianity has similar tenets. Ten, tenets. How, how do we, in the USA, take care of our own problem? Uh, there's a su southern center that researches hate, hate groups, and, and with the internet and everything, uh, uh, homegrown terrorists, you know, sitting in front of their terminals, how do we, how do we get out of this uh, box we're in? Uh, well, I don't have one answer. That's a great question. I don't but, but my point was, uh, even though people have may lapse in their religion, we need to not lapse in our humanity. Agreed. Uh, that's a great question. So I, let me say a couple things to that. It's a great, a great note to end on. The, the first is that I, I am extremely hopeful. I mean, having just written this book that was about something very, very sad, um, it's not a book that in any way counsels despair. I mean, it's really a book about, look, in all of my book, there's one terrible person. Now, he's one terrible person who had an arsenal of guns and killed 11 people. But the overwhelming experience of my reporting this book was how terrific people are. And that's my experience as a journalist. Um, anywhere that I've been in this country, and I've been to 48 states, is like how great most people are. It's also the case that America is a very, very peaceful place compared, compared to what it was in, say, 1900. Um, far, you're far less likely to be killed by gunfire now than when you were a child, uh, for example. So um, it, in many, many ways, and, and we have real cognitive bias towards thinking that everything's terrible because everything that is terrible gets re repeated endlessly to us on you know, TV, YouTube, TikTok, you know, et cetera, and, um, and so it's kind of inescapable. Um, however, the statistics, I mean, it's like, you know, there are so many fewer traffic fatalities. There are so many fewer gun fatalities. There's so many, in so many ways, there's reason to be extremely hopeful. Um, and I'm someone who tends to, oh, I always want to remind my audiences, the odds of the United States right now that any of us will be killed uh, by in a random act of gunfire are vanishingly low. I mean, none of us should worry about it. And I don't think that schools should do much to prepare for it, because I think it's, it's, it's a phantom menace. Um, I happened to write a book about one of those exceedingly rare cases where it happened. But I don't think my children's school should have lockdown drills. And it infuriates me that they do. Um, so I'm on the side of hope. If you want to know what people can do personally, um, the, the great technology of Judaism that helps bring people together. Well, let me say two things to conclude. One is, we can't worry about the haters. We can't actually change them. I actually, so people always say, how do we fight anti-Semitism? I say, it's not your job to fight anti-Semitism. Anti-Semites will you know, stew in their own you know, sickness and, and hopefully won't visit it upon us. But you can't fix them. Um, what you can do is go live and flourish and thrive and be happy and, and not spend your time thinking about how you'd fix an anti-Semite. That's not the Jew's job. So that's number one. So what can Jews or other humans do? I mean, they can do what the tradition has counseled for several thousand years, which is you know, pause one day a week to reflect on what's great and to rest and to cease from profit making, have people to dinner, um, you know, love. Thank you.
Well, before we have our final thanks to you for just a terrific uh, presentation, Mark. I do want to commend this book to all of you. There's so much more in this book than Mark was able to share with us tonight, obviously, needless to say. Uh, it's a beautiful book and such a powerful one as well. And as a gift to those of you who came here in person, we are offering free copies uh, to all of you that we've purchased um, per household, one per household, if that's okay. Um, so if uh, as you leave, there are going to be people at the back door with a ticket. And so you take your ticket from them, give it to the bookseller, and the bookseller will take that from you and give you a free book, which um, Mark then um, will graciously sign and speak uh, to you all, and uh, we have a wonderful reception out there. So um, enjoy, and let's give a final thank you to Mark Oppenheimer.